during the lecture so she could pass it around. I would appreciate it. One page. Upside down again. Uh -huh. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, sir. First, because K is a sp represents a spinless particle, relativistically normalized. The second, because phi is a scalar field. Whence? Oh, and also, of course, the vacuum state is Lorentz invariant. steps. Thus it is independent of K. On the, where K, of course, is restricted to be on the mass hyperboloid. Other questions? Well, at the end of the last lecture, we found ourselves with uh, six counter terms in our Lagrangian and six renormalization conditions for fixing them. That the expectation value of the renormalized meson field in the vacuum state be zero, a wave function renormalization condition for the meson field, a wave function renormalization condition for the nucleon field, two conditions that the mass parameters appearing in our Lagrangian be the physical masses, and one condition to fix the coupling constant, which we have at the moment left unspecified. Uh, <coughs> these conditions fix the six counter terms order by order in perturbation theory. If we can compute the conditions order by order in perturbation theory. Our perturbation theory is set up for the computation of Green's functions, and therefore we would like to phrase our six renormalization conditions in terms of Green's functions. At the moment, <coughs> only one of them is immediately phrased in terms of Green's functions. The physical vacuum expectation value of the renormalized meson field should be zero. This is a Green's function. It is a vacuum expectation value of a time-ordered product of fields, of one field. And uh, therefore, this condition is simply graphically um, <clears throat> This makes it um, very easy to iteratively determine the renormalization counter term A order by order in perturbation theory. Let me remind you what that is. There's a bunch of other stuff. Then there was A phi prime plus a bunch of other stuff. Let's imagine I have A as a power series expansion in G. I will write this as 
sum on n, a sub n, where a sub n is proportional to g to the n. I will also write the graphical representation of a in a power series, to wit, the effect of the a term is an interaction with only one line protruding from it. Are people having trouble seeing that? Should I write larger? Oh, it's fine. And I will write that as sum on n, parentheses n, where the parentheses n over the vertex means you are taking the term proportional to g to the nth. Now, let us suppose that we have computed everything up to n minus first order all Feynman graphs for all Green's functions, and by some method which I have not yet explained, all counter terms, not only A, but B, C, D, E, and F, up to n minus first order. Suppose we therefore know everything to n minus first order. Now, I will show how that enables us, by a computation, to <coughs> That enables us to determine a to the nth. The argument is very simple. We have our renormalization condition, which states that for all values of g, this blob must equal 0. We will now compute the blob to order g to the nth. there will be two terms. One will be all sorts of complicated Feynman diagrams that may well involve as internal parts all of the other counter terms in lower order, A, B, C, D, and E. By assumption, we know them, and by assumption, we are analytic strongmen. We can compute any Feynman diagram. So those terms are known in principle. They are known stuff because they only involve at their vertices counter terms of lower order. And then there is one unknown object that contributes. And it contributes in only one way. The nth power of A. The nth power of A never appears as an internal part of some diagram of more complicated structure, because if it did, that diagram would be of order higher than n. The whole thing sums to 0, and therefore, this fixes the nth power of A. So this is how we could iteratively determine the counter term A and put up a table of its values to first, second, third, fourth, etc. Uh, orders, Okay, if we can do the same sort of trick for the other counter terms. In fact, the A counter term we hardly need. Is this, is this point clear? We'll later see that exactly the same thing will happen for all the other counter terms. We will, find, we will phrase our renormalization conditions in a way that a certain sum of graphs, a Green's function or an object defined in terms of Green's functions is equal to 0. We'll carefully choose them, that if we compute it to nth order, the nth order counter term will come in only in a simple form like this, plus known stuff, and then we'll have a systematic iterative procedure for computing the counter terms. <clears throat> there is a special feature for this rather simple, simple counter term that means we don't even have to keep track of this table. This isn't true for the other counter terms, but it is true for this one. <clears throat> Suppose I consider any graph of the following structure. Here I've got absolutely anything inside this blob. And I have a large number of lines, or a small number of lines. It matters not coming out. And then I have a line here. And here I have anything else. That is to say, the graph can be cut in, is, is topologically of this structure. There is a single line such that if I cut it, 
one part of the graph is anything and the other part of the graph is anything else with only one line going into it. Now, if I sum over all the possible things I can put in for anything else, then, of course, I get, without changing this part, I just you know, put on everything I can put in here to a given order. By my renormalization condition, remember since this has only got one external momentum, it's a function of a single momentum, which is zero. <laughs> it's this uh, object equals zero. Since the pro it's the product of zero with anything. <laughs> uh, thus, in this particular case, since it is only in graphs of this structure that we can have this counter term appearing, in fact, we need not worry about the counter term and we need not worry about the renormalization condition if we simply systematically ignore all graphs of this structure since they're going to be canceled. Anything is finite. Hmm? Anything is finite. What are you worried about ultraviolet divergences? We haven't got to them yet. <laughs> okay. We will. We will. If, we, if, if, if some of our integrals turn out to be divergent, we will imagine we will truncate this theory in some way by cutting off all momentum space integrals at some high value of the momentum. And then when we're all done with everything, we'll let that high momentum cutoff go to infinity. I will discuss that in much more detail in a later lecture. Okay. The renormalization conditions would then be exactly the same. Um, These types of graphs are sometimes called uh, tadpole graphs for obvious reasons. There's the tadpole. Actually, it looks a li little bit more like a leech. <laughs> no, actually, it's a bacteriophage, isn't it? Sitting on the bacterium, yes, <laughs> ready, ready to transfer its DNA. And uh, therefore, this rule is sometimes that a phrase as the upshot of this first renormalization condition, our most trivial renormalization condition, is that all the tadpole graphs sum up to zero, and therefore you can ignore them, just as you can ignore the graphs with disconnected vacuum components. Now, this was pretty trivial, and that was a good thing, because I was able to show some ideas, like the iterative establishment of counter terms in a simple context. And I now turn to something much more complicated but uh, still, we will be able to reach the end in a fairly short time. The uh, um, phrasing uh, the wave function renormalization and mass renormalization conditions in terms of Green's functions. I will begin. <coughs> by making a general study without hardly any assumptions of um, <coughs> the uh, two-point function I will derive some properties of this object, and then from this object, of course, I can reconstruct the Green's function just by multiplying by theta functions, etc. The uh, fact I will use systematically is that if I have any state n, equals e the i p n dot y n phi prime of 0 vacuum. And the particular case of a one particle state By our normalization condition, this is equal to 1. Now, I will analyze this object 
by putting in a complete set of intermediate states and eliminating both the x and the y dependence by using this identity. Therefore, I have vacuum 5 prime of x, 5 prime of y vacuum equals, firstly, from the vacuum state, I have no contribution because 5 prime has a vanishing vacuum expectation value. And then from the one particle states, I'll explicitly put in the form of the sum over intermediate states. The P, I just get a bunch of ones from the matrix elements, and thus I obtain E the minus I, four dimensional P dot X minus Y. From um, the N part of, from the states, I'll just write as a sum over intermediate states. Of course, this is sum in an integral. I'll put a prime on it to indicate we are excluding the vacuum in one particle states. I get vacuum 5 prime of 0 N times this conjugate. So I'll just write that as squares. E to the minus I PN dot X minus Y where Pn is the momentum of the state n. OK, any questions? Or have I made my usual error of leaving out a trivial step so people get confused? <laughs> Nothing has gone into here except the summation over intermediate states and the normalization conditions. <coughs> now. Um, The, um, the first term is an object we have discussed before. It is exactly the same object that we studied for a, um, <coughs> a free field. And uh, there we called it, I don't remember if we called it delta plus with a plus downstairs or plus upstairs. Does anyone remember? Downstairs. downstairs. Delta plus x minus y m squared, where m squared is the physical mass of the meson. This um, big sum is going to give us some Lorentz invariant function of Pn, which, of course, vanishes unless um, P0 is on the um, upper hyperboloid, since we, by assumption, we only have positive energy states in our theory. That is an assumption, but uh, one we hope is true. Shouldn't put equal, should put plus. And therefore, I will write it in the following way. Integral d4 q, 2 pi cubed. That's unfortunate, but uh, I, I, I'm, running into a, I'm going to run into a convention clash with standard notation if I put a 2 pi fourth there. So I'll put a 2 pi cubed. Uh, a function, sigma of q squared, theta of q0 to tell me that things vanish except on the upper hyperboloid. e to the minus i q dot x minus y. And what sigma of q squared is, is obvious. Sigma of q squared theta of q naught equals sum on intermediate states. 2 pi cubed, to get rid of the 2 pi cubed I've dumbly put there. Vacuum 5 prime of 0 n, oops, square, sorry, n 5 prime of 0, 5 prime of 0, n, excuse me, squared, times a four-dimensional delta function of q minus pn. If I stick that expression into the previous equation, I obviously get the equation that's above it, just by doing the integral over q. See the Oh, the prime, thank you. Yes, I do not include one particle states, or nor the vacuum state. <clears throat> we know some general features about sigma of q squared. In um, since uh, in uh, perturbation theory, we would expect that the uh, lightest states, which have, can be made by a five prime field 
uh, hitting the vacuum, and I shouldn't have written m squared here, I should have written mu squared. Mu squared is what I call the meson mass, m squared is what I call the nucleon mass. Since uh, the lightest states that can be made are either two mesons or a nucleon antinucleon pair, if, uh, there, if we would expect in perturbation theory that sigma of q squared equals zero for q squared less than the minimum of 4m squared, if the nucleon and antinucleon pair is lighter, or for mu squared, if the two meson state is lighter. Of course, uh, this is just a perturbation statement. In the real theory, there might be uh, bound states appearing, which are lie below either the meson, meson or the nucleon antinucleon threshold. But uh, in any event, um, it should equal zero for, this is just perturbation theory, for q squared less than mu squared plus epsilon, where epsilon is some positive number, depending on how low the bound state goes. If the bound state sinks below the one meson state, and then we call the bound state the one meson state, because by definition, the one meson state is the lightest state with the quantum numbers of the meson. <laughs> <laughs> Epsilon greater than zero. Yeah, I wrote that. And if they're right on top of each other, then we were making the wrong assumption about the spectrum. There are two one meson states, and we have to rethink the whole thing. Yes? Uh, I don't see why sigma, as you define it, is not a function of q. Uh, uh, because of Lorentz invariance. I mean, this is obviously a Lorentz invariant object over here, a function only of x minus y squared. So its Fourier transform should be a function only of q squared. OK? Another way of saying it is that the sum over intermediate states is Lorentz invariant. The completeness sum is Lorentz invariant. Is that a satisfactory answer? Now, <clears throat> of course, because sigma is a square, we also know that sigma of q squared is always greater than or equal to zero. These two facts will be very important to us in our subsequent development. Now we go on and continue to manipulate this expression in the following trivial way. first term is incapable of being further manipulated. But the second term I will write in a dumb way, integral d cubed q over 2 pi cubed, um, integral from 0 to infinity dA squared, where A squared is a new variable delta of a squared minus q squared, sigma of a squared, that's just sigma of q squared, theta of q naught, I see I'm running into, u the minus i q, now certainly no one can fault me on that, that is just a way of rewriting sigma of q squared. I've just taken sigma of q squared and written it as something, as integral sigma of a squared dA squared. The advantage is that I can now do d4 q, I'm sorry. The advantage is I can now do the um, q integral, because what I have here is nothing more or less for each fixed value of a than the expression that would give me delta plus for a free field of mass a squared. 
that is the definition of delta plus. It's either defined this way or as a four-dimensional integral with a delta function and a theta function in it. When you do the integral over, over the fourth component, you obtain this expression. Thus, this is plus integral from 0 to infinity, actually, of course, only from the lower bound to infinity, sigma of a squared dA squared delta plus of x minus y. a squared. That is to say, we've written the exact vacuum expectation value of um, two fields as a superposition of free field vacuum expectation values, integrated over the mass spectrum of the theory. This is sometimes called the spectral representation for that reason. It is also sometimes called the layman. Does layman have two ends or one? Does anyone remember? Two? The layman. Chalain. Chalain, is that, does he have an umlaut? Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, spectral representation, because it was invented by Harry Layman, but Gunnar Chalain was a very combative man. Now, <laughs> <laughs> the, the <laughs> Um, well, he has something like it. He proves that Z3 is infinite. Well, he doesn't prove anything, but... Yeah, yeah. I thought he proved it. I think really Lehman deserves the... Well, Chilean is dead. We'll get the bonum de mortuus. The... Uh, is there any question about the derivation of the spectral representation? It is sometimes written in the form, you will see it in the literature, although we won't use this form much, rho of a squared delta plus x minus y semicolon a squared or dA squared. Rho is, of course, equal to delta of mu squared minus a squared plus sigma. Now, I will now use the spectral representation, firstly, uh, to get a representation of the commutator that will give us an interesting inequality, and uh, secondly, to get a representation of the Green's function, the time-ordered product. <coughs> Since we have everything represented as a... <coughs> linear superposition of free field quantities, then we can simply go through all of our old free field manipulations, appropriately superposing them. Thus, for example, vacuum commutator phi prime of x, phi prime of y, vacuum equals I delta x minus y m squared plus integral dA squared sigma of A squared I delta x minus y semicolon A squared. Do you want m squared or mu squared? Mu squared, I'm sorry, I keep doing that, don't I? Forgive me. <coughs> The, the, um, we can now compute the equal time commutator. This is amusing because we know what the equal, or rather the vacuum expectation value of the equal time commutator. This is amusing because we know what the equal time commutator is in terms of Z3, since we know phi prime in terms of canonical fields and Z3. Phi prime is Z3 to the minus 1 half phi. Thus, if we compute vacuum expectation value, phi prime of x and t, phi prime dot of y and the same time, vacuum. This is the vacuum expectation value of a C number, a known quantity, which is simply 
is e3 to the minus 1 i delta cubed of x minus y, because by definition of z3, phi prime is z3 to the minus 1 half times the canonical field. Any questions about the step? Does anyone want more things on the blackboard instead of mumbled? Now, on the other hand, we have from the spectral representation exactly the same thing is, well, what happens? Each of these is a free field object for an appropriate mass. So each of them, when evaluated, when derivative, when derivative, when differentiated with respect to time and evaluated equal times, will give us simply I delta cubed. Plus 1 plus integral dA squared sigma of A squared. It's a trivial integral to do, since at equal times all the integrands are identical in their x minus y dependence. <laughs> Comparing these two things, we find Lehmann's sum rule. Since sigma is guaranteed to be non-negative, since it is a square, v3 minus 1 is greater than or equal to 1, and most likely equal to, uh, greater than, if we could only be equal to if sigma vanishes, which would be a pretty trivial field theory, <laughs> or equivalently, z3 is less than or equal to 1. It is sometimes said that this statement <coughs> has a um, trivial uh, explanation. Uh, after all, the definition of z3 to the 1 half is that z3 to the 1 half equals k phi of 0 in the unrenormalized field vacuum. I will now tell you an argument that is a lie, but at least will help you remember the sign. People say, look, we know phi of 0 hitting the vacuum makes a single bare particle. And therefore, uh, this is the amplitude for making a physical particle. So that's the inner product between a physical particle and a bare particle. And that's obviously less than 1, like all inner products between appropriately normalized states. <laughs> the argument is a lie, of course, because it is phi has, is a uh, scale so that it has amplitude 1 for making a bare particle when applied to the bare vacuum, and here we're applying it to the physical vacuum. So the argument is completely useless. Nevertheless, it'll help you to remember the sign. <laughs> any questions about any of this? This stuff, by the way, is also all we treated at enormous length in all standard texts, including Bjorkin and Drell. Now we go on. We have been having fun, but we haven't gotten very close to expressing our renormalization conditions in terms of perturbation theory objects, in terms of Green's functions. So we will go on and compute the uh, Green's function. Of course, once we know the vacuum expectation value of the unordered product, we know the uh, G2, the two-particle Green's function, by a linear sequence of operations, permuting the arguments, multiplying by theta functions, Fourier transforming, etc. So we can just write down the answer. It's convenient to express things in terms of objects with the delta function factored out. So I'll write this as 2 pi to the fourth, delta fourth of p plus p prime, an entity I will call d prime of p. d prime of p, sometimes the prime indicates renormalized fields. d prime of p is sometimes called the renormalized propagator. So what happens to the pathetic old ordinary Feynman propagator 
when one puts all sorts of corrections on it <laughs> to get what really happens when one meson goes into a blob and one meson goes out. <clears throat> D prime of P is, by the spectral representation, a linear superposition of free propagators with the same weighting function as on the left-hand board. That is to say, it's I over k squared minus mu squared plus I epsilon plus integral. Uh, yes, thank you. dA squared, sigma of A squared, I over P squared minus A squared plus I epsilon. <clears throat> this um, spectral representation um, tells us something very interesting about the analytic properties of d prime of p considered as a function of complex p. As you see, for example, for all p's not equal to mu squared, nor on, or I should say not on the positive real axis, this integral defines an analytic function of p. Because if p squared is not on the real axis, positive real axis, the denominator of ever vanishes, so the function is well defined and its derivative is well defined. Thus, if I were to draw the complex p squared plane, prime of p squared would be an analytic function in that plane, except for a pole at mu squared, and the cut beginning from the place where sigma begins, a line of singularities, and extending out presumably to infinity. The actual physical value of d prime for real P is, of course, totally unambiguous <coughs> along here. Along here, we have to say which side of the cut we're on. But Feynman's I epsilon tells us which side of the cut we're on. It says P squared plus I epsilon, which means we are above the cut in this analytic continuation of D prime. So physical value, The actual original d prime defined only for real p squared is obtained by taking the analytic function onto the cut from above. That is OK. It has a uniquely defined analytic continuation given by this formula. And uh, the physical, when there's a cut along the real axis, as there is, the physical value is obtained by going onto the cut from above. And those of you who have studied non-relativistic scattering theory, the analytic properties of partial wave amplitudes will not find this analytic structure particularly surprising. <laughs> yes? What trouble do you get into if some of uh, sigma of a squared integral doesn't converge? If sigma, well, I, of course, have been going on a slob level. <clears throat> that means the sum over intermediate states doesn't converge. Um, there is, um, the problem then arises. Um, up to here, how should I put it? This formula is absolutely great. If sigma of a squared has any reasonable behavior, the essential reason is that um, uh, delta or delta plus is exp uh, falls off exponentially for large a squared and fixed x minus y. So there is no problem there. Here it looks like somehow we've deduced that sigma of a squared is polynomially bounded. And in fact, bound, it goes to 0 more rapidly than 1 over a squared, which is strange, since the only thing we needed at the input was that it didn't grow exponentially rapidly. The trick is that the, the, uh, the swindle I put on you is that if sigma of a squared grows um, uh, too rapidly at infinity, so it grows like a power of a squared, then if you look at this function in, <coughs> in position space, it's a well-defined distribution. But it's not true that a theta function times a distribution is necessarily a distribution. 
case, the time order products might not be defined. The time order product might not be defined. I will assume that in our case, the time order product is defined. That is the sort of thing purists have to worry about. Could okay, we may become purists when we get a deeper understanding of field theory and go back and worry about that. Could you do your whole perturbation theory in terms of non-time order? Uh, not to my knowledge. They always come in, but um, don't worry. The, we, in the theories we will do, this, this possible disease will not arise, and if it does arise, there is a cure for it. Okay. In any, in any way, all of the manipulations we are doing are in principle, if we ever reach any trouble, we are right, quite willing to be slobs. If we cannot justify our intermediate stages with what we've got, we will brutally truncate our theory by throwing away the high momentum modes, therefore making sigma vanish beyond a certain point and guaranteeing the convergence of everything. Okay, we'll just cut them out of the theory. Bam. It's of course then a sick nonsensical theory it's, uh, that's not real physics, but uh, we'll just go on ahead and when we finally get our expressions, the S matrix elements, if they have nice smooth limits as the cutoff goes away, we're happy. We will have reached a satisfactory result even if our intermediate stages are garbage. <laughs> if they don't, there's no point worrying about mathematical rigor because nothing you can do will make sense out of it. <laughs> okay? So that, that's our general attitude whenever we run into trouble because of the high energy behavior of integrals. That's, that's a, you know, what, you know, people who make, uh, who are not trained carpenters but nevertheless build houses are called wood butchers. This is a physics butcher's attitude. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, uh, Now we actually know a little bit more about d prime of p. It has a nice property. It has what is called in the theory of functions of a complex variable, the Schwartz reflection principle, or more appropriately, I should say, minus i d prime of p has that property to get rid of the i in the numerator. And indeed, it's easy to see from the spectral formula that minus i d prime of p star is minus i d prime of p star. Once I've multiplied by minus i to get rid of the i in the numerator, conjugating p is the same as conjugating the function in the domain of analyticity. If you're above the cut, this is the value below the cut. The discontinuity over the cut is therefore connected to the imaginary part of uh, d prime and uh, by a formula we had already in a homework problem, <coughs> imaginary part I could have called it d prime of p squared. I guess I really should. It's really only a function of p squared. The um, <coughs> is um, minus pi sigma of p squared, p squared real and greater than mu squared. That's the difference between the value above the cut and the value below the cut, and it just comes from the statement that the imaginary part of 1 over x plus i epsilon is minus pi times the delta function. Now, <coughs> What do our wave function mass and wave, please notice that although I have been emphasizing this point, our mass and wave function renormalization prescriptions are embedded in this analysis of d prime. The statement that the physical mass of the meson is mu squared tells us that d prime has a pole at mu squared. The statement that the field is properly normalized tells us that the residue of this pole is I. If the field had been normalized differently, the residue of the pole would be 17i or one third i or something. <laughs> Therefore, the mass and wave function renormalization properties are embedded, renormalization conditions are embedded in a statement about the Green's function. Mass renormalization says, well, they're both in here.
analytic. That contains our two renormalization conditions. It contains the mass renormalization condition and the wave function renormalization condition. They're both in that single statement. Mass renormalization that there is a pole at mu squared, wave function renormalization condition that the residue of that pole is one. Okay? Therefore, this gives us, in principle, a way of fixing the mass and wave function renormalization condition, finding out what the mass of the particle is and what the normalization of the field is, just in terms of uh, the properties of, the, of a Green's function, d prime, which is defined in terms of a Green's function. Now, this condition will have to be massaged a bit to put it into really the best form for doing the computation we want to do. And I will now do that massaging by defining a special kind of uh, Green's function, what is called a one-particle irreducible Green's function. Denoted by one pi for one particle irreducible and indicated by a blob like this with however many external lines are coming out of it. I will say this is, this is the sum of all graphs that obey the following properties. They're connected. And cannot be disconnected by cutting a single internal line. <coughs> to give, uh, by convention, when we evaluate IPI diagrams, we do not include, this is just by convention, just like the conventions for the Green's functions, we do not include the energy momentum conserving delta function, nor external line propagators. That's just a convention that will turn out to make our algebra with these things a bit simpler than it would be otherwise. Oh, uh, yeah. To give an example of what is an IPI graph and what is not an IPI graph, one PI, I should say, there is, um, well, take nucleon, antinucleon, into nucleon, antinucleon in our model theory. <laughs> this graph is not IPI because I can by breaking this line, cause it to fall into two parts. On the other hand, this graph is IPI because there is no way I can cause it to break into two parts by, um, um, by breaking any one internal line, it still remains connected. I have to break at least two internal lines to make it fall apart. <clears throat> Is this definition clear? I'm now ready to define an object in terms of which we will finally express simply our mass and wave function renormalization conditions. I look at the 1 pi 2 meson function, and I define this, it's obviously only a function of k squared, to be minus i, for reasons that will become clear later, pi prime of k squared. Pi prime is called the self-energy operator. The reason for that name will become clear in three minutes.
Now, let's look at the total Green's function, two particle Green's function, the object we have described by d prime, and write it in terms of pi prime. That can be done. I argue as follows. This is always so lovely, you make drawings, and then they turn in, which are easy to manipulate, and then they turn into equations, which are easy to manipulate. What is the perturbation series for this object? Well, first, I could have a single unadorned line. That's what I have in zeroth order. And then I could have a one particle irreducible diagram, just sitting there with the two external lines on to give me the propagators that I've left off by convention. Now, I then could have a diagram that's actually one particle reducible. That is to say, which I can cut someplace and make fall into two parts. Let me assume there's only one place where I can cut it. Well, then on the left-hand side of the cut, there must be something one particle irreducible. Then there must, here I explicitly display the one line I can cut to make it fall into two parts. Got to be cut somewhere between there as we go along. And then everything else, by definition, must be one particle irreducible because there's only one place where I can cut it. Now suppose there are two places where I can cut it. Well, <laughs> That's it. Those are the two places explicitly displayed. Everything between the first possible cut and the second possible cut must be one particle irreducible. Everything to the left must be, everything to the right must be, plus dot, dot, dot. Now, what does this say in equations? <coughs> well, in equations, it says, factoring out the overall delta function that occurs everywhere, on the left-hand side, I have, by definition, d prime of p squared equals i over p squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. That's the lowest order part. And then I have a propagator, a minus i pi prime of p squared because that's what the one particle irreducible graph is. And we see the i and the minus i cancel, which is why I stuck them there. If what happens in the next term? Plus i over p squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. Well, I've got the same thing. except I've got it twice. And we observe that we have obtained a geometric series, which sums up to i over p squared minus mu squared minus pi prime of p squared plus i epsilon. This is why pi prime is called the self-energy operator sometimes, or the self-energy function, or the self-mass function because it adds to the mass. <laughs> Any question about this little stretch of graphical analysis? Yes, Kay. Do these graphs that we're considering have little choices for counterturns in them? Yes, in particular. The second order IPI self-energy diagrams are, um, sorry. I drew a big line where I should have drawn a little one. Whoops. Here's one. That's IPI. There's no pull you can cut it in two by cutting an internal line. And this one is also IPI, uh -huh. where this is to be evaluated only to second order in power series. Uh -huh. OK. Yeah. Because look at it. You can't cut this in two pieces. by cut. It doesn't even have any internal lines to cut. So you <laughs> <laughs> Now, <clears throat> the 
the, uh, now we can phrase our renormalization conditions in terms of pi prime. The d is an analytic function near p squared equals mu squared except for a pole. And therefore, d inverse is an analytic function near p squared equals mu squared, period, since the inverse of a pole is a zero, which does not affect analyticity. And in particular, therefore, pi prime has a power series expansion in terms of p squared at p squared equals mu squared. pi prime at mu squared must be 0. Because if it were not, d would not have a pole at p squared equals mu squared. <laughs> Thus we have from the statement that the physical mass of the meson is mu squared. The residue of d prime must be 1. Therefore, the first derivative of pi prime must be 0, because if it were not 0, this would not near the pole be 1 over p squared minus mu squared, but 1 over 1 plus the first derivative times p squared minus mu squared. Therefore, these are these two statements on pi prime, which are rather nicer than saying a function has a pole and that its residue has one. It says a function vanishes and its derivative also vanishes, are precisely equivalent to our two renormalization conditions. Okay. These can, is everyone happy? Are people looking blank because this is also trivial, or looking blank because it's also baffling? If pi prime of mu squared were not 0, d prime of 0, d prime of mu squared would be 1 over minus pi prime of mu squared, which is not a pole. Okay. If there's the function is to have a pole at p squared equals mu squared, its denominator must vanish at p squared equals mu squared. If the residue of that pole is to be 1, then the derivative of the inverse of the function must be 1. Is that you happy? Mm -hmm. OK, good. Now, the nice thing about these conditions is that they enable us to iteratively determine the um, wave function, uh, the mass and wave function renormalization constants in exactly the same way explained 40 minutes ago for the uh, A counter term. Let's focus on the B and C counter terms. L equals plus 1 half B d mu phi squared minus C over 2 phi squared. This leads to an interaction which I'll indicate by a single cross. It, of course, is determined in terms of two coefficients. There's a b part, which gives us um, um, i b p squared, and the c part, which gives us minus i c, as demonstrated at the end of last lecture. <coughs> As before, we break this up into a power series in the coupling constant, indicating each term by a parentheses n. As before, we assume 
that we uh, give no everything to order n minus 1 and are about to compute things to order n. We have by assumption known stuff just as before plus two unknown things the only two IPI diagrams that involve unknown, only IPI diagram that involves unknown objects. The nth order contribution of the B and C counter terms. Everything else involves other counter terms, perhaps, or these counter terms, but to lower orders in perturbation theory or complicated Feynman graphs, which we assume we can compute. We have <coughs> two conditions. And therefore, we fix b to the n and c to the n by demanding that the sum vanish at p squared equals mu squared, which fixes b plus b mu squared plus c, and that the derivative vanishes, which fixes b. b sub n, I guess I called it, c sub n. That this the, the, the graph that this contributes is minus I B P squared minus I C. Oh, okay. That came from the end of last lecture. Well the minus I C we've known for a long time. The fact that this gave us a P squared we discovered at the end of last lecture. All of this goes through mutatis mutandum uh, for um, the um, um, uh, nucleon field, since our nucleon is not really that different than a meson, despite the name we've given it, it's just another scalar field. <laughs> I won't bother to write down the whole spectral representation of any counter terms, the counter terms associated with nucleon mass and wave function renormalization. It's just the same thing written over again. And I guess you could figure out how to write it if we had a theory with 22 scalar fields. <laughs> The, um, we found something very nice when we were considering the A counter term. We found the result of our conditions was that we could always ignore the A counter term and indeed ignore, ignore all graphs that contain tadpoles. Nothing nearly as nice happens here, unfortunately. We cannot ignore graphs that have these sorts of insertions on them, especially if they occur as internal lines. But we can ignore these kinds of insertions if we are dealing with um, external lines and if we are computing S matrix elements. The reason is that, well, let me write it down, and then I'll say the words. For an S matrix element, that is to say all lines on the mass shell, We can ignore all corrections to external lines. The reason is that in getting an on the mass shell S matrix element, we multiply by P squared minus mu squared and then go on to the mass shell thus turning the external bare propagator into I. The result of all possible corrections put on the external lines is just to turn the propagator into D prime, which has a pole at the same place and a residue at the same place, so why bother about them? <laughs> now, in principle, if I were now to go on, I would now give the definition of the um, of the uh, coupling constant renormalization, which I have not yet made, and therefore complete our program of determining all the writing down equations that will enable us in an efficient way to determine all the renormalization constants iteratively. Um, but I'd like to do something else, just for variety, since uh, I'd like to do a simple computation to show these things working out. And um, 
Therefore, I will um, uh, compute something that doesn't really require a coupling conservation. I'll compute the meson self-energy to operator f function to order g squared, just so you can see how the renormalizations work out. And we'll also learn a little, some little tricks about how to do integrals of this kind, which is why I hope you all have copies of that integral table I distributed. It. <laughs> I won't get to it for another five minutes, but I just want to make sure <laughs> someone shouts he doesn't have a copy. Now, there are um, two graphs that contribute to order g squared to pi prime. One is this graph, our first Feynman graph we're going to look at seriously, containing a closed loop. And the other is the g squared contribution to this thing. This thing is, of course, will be determined iteratively in terms of the other entities. Therefore, I have pi prime now, actually, the thing we get from the graph is minus i pi prime equals the contribution of this explicit Feynman graph, which for the moment I will just call minus i pi f. I'll write it down in a moment. It's a function, of course, of p squared. Plus the contribution from this thing here, where the b and c counter terms are evaluated only to second order in perturbation theory, and thus I get minus i b2 p squared, uh, sorry, plus i, I see I wrote there, minus i c2, the term proportional to g squared. Okay, now b2 and c2 are determined iteratively by the conditions which I still have written down on the board. And therefore, if I'm not interested in doing higher order computations, as I am not at the moment, I can eliminate them from the equation right away and write minus i pi prime is minus i pi f of p squared minus pi f of mu squared minus p squared minus mu squared d pi f d p squared evaluated at mu squared. Should be a square bracket. That's obviously the right thing. I've added a term proportional to p squared and a constant term such that the total expression vanishes and such that its first derivative vanishes. Thus, I have written pi, I have eliminated b2 and c2. If you want to compute them, of course, you can compute them just by comparing this equation to this equation. But if I'm only interested in computing pi prime to second order, this expression suffices. Now, let's do the computation. So the important thing is to compute pi f, then we'll plug it into this formula and get the real pi prime. Well, to do that, let's label our momentum. Here there is momentum p coming in. There's an unknown loop momentum, which I'll call k, and say it comes around this way, so this internal momentum is k. The momentum coming along here is p plus k, and the momentum going out here is p. The internal momenta are oriented along the lines, not that it matters since all the propagators are even functions. k is an unknown momentum, not determined by energy momentum conservation. It's the momentum that runs around the loop this way, and I have to integrate over it. Now, therefore, I have minus i pi f equals, well, firstly, let's compute the i's. I have a minus i g from each vertex. I have an i squared from each Feynman, i from each Feynman propagator, and there are two of them. That takes care of all the i's and all the g's. Now the integration, I have to integrate over the unknown momentum.
I have the propagator of the meson line, of the nucleon line carrying momentum K. And I have the propagator of the line carrying momentum K plus B. This is simply a straightforward application of the Feynman rules. As stated, this will be a function of P only. Any question about where this formula came from? OK, everyone happy? That's the, the rule. Now, of course, you may be getting a little it's, uh, antsy because uh, this uh, integral, although uh, many of its properties are not obvious, one of them is very obvious, it's divergent. But we'll uh, worry about that in uh, five or 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll avoid, I'll be very, I'll put on blinders and, and not worry about that for just a few minutes more. <laughs> Is there any question about how I got to where the integral comes from? And there are people whispering, so is there some question? Or they're just saying, why is he going so slow? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. The um, next stage is to um, do uh, is to uh, manipulate this integral using a famous formula to the Feynman. Suppose I consider the following expression: integral from zero to one, one over a x plus b one minus x quantity squared, where I assume a and b are such dx where I assume that A and B are such that there is no pole in the domain of integration. Now, the integral is rather trivial, since it is a rational function. It's um, 1 over B minus A, 1 over AX plus B, 1 minus X, evaluated between 0 and 1, which is 1 over b minus a, 1 over a minus 1 over b, or 1 over b a. We will apply this formula to our integral for pi f using uh, the two Feynman denominators as b and a. Because of the i epsilons, they indeed satisfy the condition that it never vanishes inside the domain of integration. Therefore, I have minus i pi f equals, I might as well take care of those i squareds and those minus i squareds, g squared, integral. d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, integral 0 to 1 dx, 1 over, let's see, what do we have? k squared is multiplied by both x and 1 minus x. Uh, p dot k is multiplied, say, only by x. p squared is multiplied only by x. m squared is multiplied by both x and 1 minus x and i epsilon is multiplied by both x and 1 minus x. <clears throat> now, we are now in a very nice position for doing uh, this kind of integral because we can, again, blithely not worrying about the divergences, which I will come to in a moment, we can blithely shift the domain of integration and define p prime equal, uh, sorry, k prime, I should call it, equals k plus p, when k prime squared x equals k squared plus 2p dot x plus p squared x squared. Thus, I can write the integral as g squared integral d4 k prime over 2 pi to the fourth integral from 0 to 1 dx, 
This is the famous parameter plus shift trick. I will later tell you how to do it when there are three or four or five lines running around the loop. <laughs> One over k prime squared plus p squared x times 1 minus x minus m squared plus i epsilon squared. Any questions about this expression or how we have obtained it? The integral is now awfully easy to do because it's a Euclidean, it's rotationally invariant, or I should say Lorentz invariant, but we'll shortly go into Euclidean space and make it Euclidean invariant. Are there any questions about this stage? We've noticed the lecture has shifted gears from doing highbrow theory. We are now grubbing around with integrals, but it's important you learn how to do both. <laughs> okay. Now we are really, yes? Oh, p dot k, yes, 2x. Thank you. Flip of the chalk. Now, the, um, now we have to face the fact that this integral is divergent. Uh, in fact, we don't have to face the fact that it's divergent. Because what we're really interested in is not pi f, but this whole thing inside the square brackets. And pi f, if we just look at the first two terms, the derivative of pi f with respect to p squared is obviously convergent because that drags down another power of k squared. Uh, pi f Convergent. Because when I subtract inside the integral, this thing evaluated for p squared and this thing evaluated for mu squared, the difference goes like 1 over k to the 6 at high k and is therefore a convergent integral. What a surprise. And I mean, it really is a surprise. Renormalization, which we invented, crossed my heart, you saw me doing it, just in order to turn the wrong perturbation theory for the wrong quantities in terms of the wrong expansion parameter with the wrong masses held fixed into the right perturbation theory for the right quantities with the right expansion parameter and the right masses held fixed without ever bothering our little heads about the question of infinities. <laughs> turns out to reveal itself as being not Clark Kent but Superman <laughs> and come to rescue us when we are confronted with this otherwise insuperable problem of divergences. <laughs> we would have come to a screaming halt if we hadn't renor at this point if we had not renormalized our perturbation theory. As it turns out, however, this means like these quantities like B2, not C2, I'm oh, sorry, not B2, but C2, is in fact given by a divergent integral. And whether or not that's bad news or good news is something we have to worry about. And we will worry about it in a little while. But the quantity pi prime, which is the only thing that's physically observable, is represented by a perfectly convergent integral. Now, will this continue to all orders in perturbation theory? Does this happen in only this theory? I'm not going to prove that in this lecture. Does this happen in only this theory or in all theories? Well, those are interesting questions. But for the moment, let us be thankful with what we have and continue with this computation. We will turn to those questions later. <laughs> Now, I would like to explain, and I, of course, I will run five minutes over time by an ancient tradition. <laughs> I would like to explain how one finishes doing the integral. And um, that is to say, in fact, I could now say you could do that integral by looking things up in our integral table, which I distributed, and then uh, plugging it in and turning every, and then you just have the parametric integral over x to do, which you can do with the aid of Dwight's tables. But uh, the, um, I would like to explain how you derive that integral table, which tells you how to do all integrals of all kinds that arise in one loop integrations. And uh, that requires a little side story, which I'll give. And then we can assemble the whole thing and get the answer to this particular integral. <clears throat> the 
Let me suppose I have an integral of this form, d4q over q squared minus a plus i epsilon, where a is some real number, to some power n. I'll explain how to do that integral. I guess in the tables I wrote plus a, but in my notes I wrote minus a. I suppose you can make that sort of transposition. Um, let us focus attention. I will normally consider the case n greater than or equal to 3 and an integer, in which case the integral is convergent. However, um, in fact, we may frequently run across expressions with lesser values of n as parts of sums of terms, such as here, such that the total thing is convergent, even though the individual terms in the integrand are not. And therefore, in the integral tables, you also see values of these things for n equals 1 or 2. But those are to be taken cum grano salis, i.e. used only in convergent combinations. <laughs> now, to do this integral, I am going to rotate the contour of the q0 integration. Well, first I'll put it out explicitly. Q squared plus a plus i epsilon to the nth. And consider where the singularities arise in the complex Q0 plane. We have two possibilities. Q squared plus a can be greater than 0, or Q squared plus a can be less than 0. Of course, it can be equal to 0, but that's trivial. That'll, they'll turn out to go continuously into each other. Yes, sir? A minus I epsilon? Yes, that's a minus i epsilon, and thank you. If it hadn't been, I would have been in big trouble. <laughs> if q squared plus a is greater than 0, then the poles are the square roots of q squared plus a are over here on the real axis, and the i epsilon distorts them a little bit like this. And here's our original contour of integration. If q squared plus a is uh, uh, less than a 0, then the, original, the thing we're taking the square root of is a little bit below the real axis down here. And therefore, the poles lie one a little bit perturbed here and the other bit a little bit perturbed here off the real axis, off the imaginary axis. And the contour of integration is the same. In both cases, we can, assuming the integral is convergent, which it is under these circumstances, rotate the contour of integration without encountering any singularities to the positive imaginary axis. The singularities are always placed so that is possible in either case. Therefore, we do that, turning our integral from a Minkowski space integral into a Euclidean integral, to be precise. We define Q0 equals I Q4. Um, Q squared is therefore minus Q Euclidean squared, i.e. minus Q squared plus Q4 squared. And um, D4Q is I d4 q Euclidean equals I dq4 d cube q. Thus, by this rotation of contours, our integral becomes <coughs> I integral d4 q Euclidean minus q Euclidean squared minus a plus i epsilon. I may still have to call down to the i epsilon in number 2 to the end. Any question about this? 
ensure that the contour is going to be kind of if the integral is sufficiently convergent, which is the case I am always doing. I'm not interested in doing this integral when it is divergent. Whenever it's convergent. Whenever it's convergent, the cont integral at inf cont obviously this, th this thing goes at least as q0 to the sixth. One over q0 to the sixth is far more than good enough at fixed q to make me close, be able, enable to close the contour at infinity. Okay. Is it not, it's not obvious to me what, once you've done the integral to q to q, no, no, no. I'm doing the 2q0 integral first. I'm holding the integral d cube q. I'm holding q fixed. OK. Now, our next question. We now have a spherically symmetric integral to do in Euclidean space. So we need another little piece of lore, which will only take us two minutes to derive, which is how to do spherically symmetric integrals in Euclidean space. We, everyone knows how to turn spheric, do spherically symmetric integrals in ordinary three-dimensional space. How will we do spherically symmetric integrals in Euclidean space? So this is part one, the rotation into Euclidean space that turns the integral of desired form into this integral. Now we come to part two. How do we integrate rotationally in Euclidean space? So. really become a very nuts and bolts -y lecture, hasn't it? Well, that's probably good towards the end. You don't have to strain your brain too much in following the nuts and bolts part. Integral d4 q Euclidean times any function of q Euclidean squared. Now, if I introduce a variable z equals q Euclidean squared, this integral is obviously something times some constant a times integral z dz. That's the r cubed dr <laughs> that would normally come in, f of z integrated from 0 to infinity. No question there, I hope. The only problem is, what is a? Okay, if it were two-dimensional space, a, well, it wouldn't be a z dz. There would just be a dz, and a would be pi. What is it in four-dimensional space? Since a is a universal function, a, un a number, a constant, which we could get by going through spherical coordinates in four space, but that's a pain in the neck, we, can, uh, we only have to be able to evaluate this integral for a single function to find out what a is. I will look at the function f equals e to the minus q Euclidean squared, which is also, of course, the product of four Gaussians one for each component. <laughs> Treating it as the product of four Gaussians, I can do the rest left-hand side of the integral because it is four Gaussian integrals, one after another, and gives me pi squared, square root of pi for each of the four Gaussian integrals. On the right-hand side, I have a integral 0 to infinity, z dz, e to the minus z, which is, of course, a, since this is 1 factorial, or 1. <laughs> And therefore, we've determined a without having to go to spherical coordinates in your four-dimensional space. Thank God, a is pi squared. And we have the general rule. That's how you determine the volume of a sphere in four space without doing any work. <laughs> oh, no, no limits. That's right. They go over all things. Now I'm in a position to derive the integral table. I'll do the integral table by, well, I'm running over. OK, I'll stop now. We now have. Oh, no, 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 I'll, I'll just, <laughs> can't resist. I'll derive the integral table by plugging it into the expression for pi and then doing pi, I'll set reserve for next lecture. Actually, we only need to do one integral from the integral table. To do the integral table, we really only have to do the integral from 0 to some upper bound lambda, 
z dz of 1 over z plus a. This is what we would get from the simplest times uh, pi squared, of course, but there's, I won't bother putting that down. This is what we would get from the simplest integral, that for which n equals 1. It's in a convergent combination, so we don't have lose anything by uh, knocking off the integration at some, high energy, at some high k squared n, which I call lambda, because this is supposed to be part of a sum of terms which is all convergent. <clears throat> so I'll assume lambda is much greater than a. OK, well, the integral is pretty simple. This is z plus a minus a. So I get lambda plus um, minus a log lambda plus a over a. That's z plus z is z plus a minus a. <clears throat> this is equal to lambda minus a log lambda my plus a log a plus order a over lambda which I neglect because lambda is supposed to be very large. Now, if this is part of a convergent combination of terms that, in fact, do not depend on lambda, such a total integral doesn't depend on lambda, that means all terms in the individual integrands that depend on lambda must vanish in such a combination. That's what convergent combination means. So this term and this term vanish in convergent combinations. If there's a sum of such terms, such that the whole thing is convergent, then the individual lambda terms between the terms must cancel. That's what convergence means. If you now look at the entry in the integral table for I1, you will see with the appropriate insertions of i's from the Euclidean rotations, pi squared from here, 2 pi to the forces, and changes of signs, what we have derived is just the I1 entry. Everyone stare at that, please. A log A. Well, it's A log minus A. That's the change of sign when you go to Euclidean space. <laughs> OK? Everyone happy. You should be able to derive that. That's how you get I1. How do you get I2, I3, I4, A5, et cetera? You get them by differentiating with respect to A. <laughs> I leave that to you as an exercise. <laughs> you are now in the position to derive the integral table for yourself in exactly the same way I derived it. And maybe you'll surprise me by discovering that I made a sign error someplace, although I don't <laughs> think I did. <laughs> Next lecture, we will apply the integral table to complete our computation of pi prime to second order. We will discuss coupling constant renormalization talk about some marvelous properties of realistic pion-nucleon scattering and pion-nucleon-nucleon and scattering. And we may begin a discussion of what happens when the meson becomes heavier than twice the nucleon, what happens when it becomes unstable.